Well, my name is Brian Capricci. I'm a wedding and portrait photographer. That's me up there. <laughs> um, I'm located in Niagara, so not too far from here. And um, I switched to mirrorless photography about a year and a half ago. And I'm going to talk today a little bit about why I switched, what it's meant for me and my photography, and how it's improved uh, the way that I see the world through the lens. So before we get into that story, I want to tell you a little bit about what I do as a photographer. When I have 10 kids, three pairs of parents, and I said a grandparents, it's my job as a professional photographer to arrange them, get them all to look at the camera while still looking through the lens to take a picture. It's my job as a professional photographer to be photographing a bride while she's getting ready in the morning of her wedding and then be aware enough to look over my shoulder and see the dad's reaction as he sees his daughter in her wedding dress for the first time. It's my job as a professional photographer to make the rain location where we have to go undercover in the middle of a family portrait session still look good for family portraits. It's my job as a professional photographer to make the middle of the day, which is arguably the most difficult time for lighting, still look good for the images that I'm making. It's my job as a professional photographer to always get the best images, the best moments for my clients so that they can enjoy them forever and for always. However, there's this sort of saying that says the shoemaker's kids have no shoes. And something that I was acutely aware of is uh, being a professional photographer myself, I always felt self-conscious carrying around my big camera to family functions or carrying around my big camera when I was going on vacation because I just didn't feel right. I felt like I was being a photographer in those moments and I didn't want to feel that way. I wanted to be able to live in the moment. And in March 2013, my wife and I had our daughter, Ava. And I knew at that moment that I know the importance of photography, yet I don't want to feel like that guy with a camera walking around with all these giant lenses to photograph my daughter. There seemed to be something wrong with me being this guy at the pumpkin patch chasing around a bunch of two-year-olds. So I made the decision then to sort of start investigating what else was out there so I could still document my life and the life of my daughter and my family without feeling like a professional photographer when I'm out with my family. So I went to a workshop in 2013 with a photographer by the name of David Beckstead. And David was photographing at this workshop with a camera called the Fujifilm X-E1. It was the first iteration of Fujifilm's digital mirrorless cameras. And the moment I looked through the lens on that X-C1, David had it set to black and white mode. And I looked through it, looking at the model that we were photographing at the workshop, and I totally fell in love with how it looked through the lens. Now, I knew obviously that a camera does not make someone a better photographer, but something about it, something about its retro styling, something about the way that the electronic viewfinder worked that I'll talk about in a minute, inspired me to see differently. So I went home and I bought one. And I bought it with a 60 millimeter lens. And I was, the day that it was supposed to arrive, and because you know how we, when we buy stuff, we like check it online and we're tracking like when's it coming in. And then like when the Perlator guy comes to the door, you practically like hug him as he comes and gives you the box. And so I bring the box up to my office and I open it up. And the first thing I do, which is something we all do, is uh, we're, we're excited, right? We're just like, all right, I'll get it. I'm super excited. And uh, did I skip over that? Where is it? Here, that lost its effect. Hang on, let me try it again. There it is. So I was super excited, right? And I turn around with the camera and the lens on, and I take a picture of the first thing I see beside me, which was my telephone. This is the most important image I've ever made in my life, because it's the first image that I made with my Fujifilm mirrorless camera. And it was the start of what I now believe is what changed me as a photographer and the way that I see things. So I made this image beside me because it was right there. And immediately right afterwards, I went outside. I brought my wife and my daughter out in our front yard and just wanted to take a couple quick photos of them just to see what this camera could do. When I started seeing images like this and images like this of my daughter giving me the stink eye and images like this around the house, I fell in love with it 
because as you can see, it's not a big camera. It's a small camera. It's very compact. It's very light. It's very easy to use. It's almost unnoticeable when I'm walking around with it. And as I'm going around the house and taking these images and bringing it with me on vacation and documenting my daughter, our life, and our family, I'm falling in love with it more and more and more because all of a sudden, for the first time in my life and in my career as a photographer, I didn't feel like a photographer when I was out with my family. I felt like I could just have this little portable camera and take great images, and I loved the quality. It was wonderful. And it was great because all of a sudden, I could be in some of the photos, my daughter loved it, sometimes she maybe didn't love it, but the point is, is that I was able to walk around the house, I was able to live my life, I was able to be in the moment and still capture great images and tell great stories of my family as my daughter grew up. The nice thing about it is because it's so simple, it's a camera that I can just pass off to a family member and I can actually be in the images now. So this is my daughter last week. And obviously she's now two and a half years old. And the thing that inspired me to get to look into mirrorless photography and to use it in my daily life was her. Because now I have all these great images, all these great memories of my daughter growing up. My wife is now pregnant again and due in March. And I'll be able to do the same thing for our next child growing up. Now, that's what got me into mirrorless photography in 2013. Since then, I thought initially it would just be that I would use it for my personal stuff and I would just have a camera to have there. But as I started using it more and more and more and more, I fell in love with it and I started to integrate it into my professional work. And I'm going to talk about that in just a few moments. Before we go into that, and I want to tell you guys a few stories about how mirrorless has changed how I see things, I want to just talk a little bit about the actual technology itself and what mirrorless photography really means. As far as I'm concerned, there's three different kinds of cameras. You have a point-and-shoot camera, you have a mirrorless camera, and you have a digital SLR. The technology behind SLRs has been around for a long, 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 long time. And the really biggest difference between an SLR and a mirrorless camera is the fact that a mirrorless camera is mirrorless. There's no mirror in it. That's the only difference. <laughs> a lot of people look at the small mirrorless cameras, the Fujifilm mirrorless cameras, the, the Panasonics, the Sonys, any of them, and they say, well, they must not be the same quality because they're so much smaller. Don't be fooled by that because the only difference a mirrorless camera is smaller than a digital SLR is because with an SLR, you've got the mirror and you need room for the light to bounce around on the inside. So the light comes in here into the camera on an SLR bounces up the mirror into the pentaprism and then out the viewfinder. So what you're seeing when you look through the lens of an SLR is the light actually reflected into your eyes. So you're seeing the real life version of what's in front of your lens. When you're using a mirrorless camera, the light actually comes in, hits the sensor on the back of the, the camera, and then what you're seeing through your eye is that sensor being digitally transposed up to your eye. That's the only difference, but in that difference, there's a huge difference. Because the image that you're seeing when you're photographing with a mirrorless camera is the actual image that will be recorded on the sensor and on your camera card the second that you press the button. Meaning that if you're photographing with a mirrorless camera in black and white mode, you're actually seeing in black and white as you're taking the image. If you're photographing with a mirrorless camera in manual exposure mode, and you dial your exposure up or down, you're actually seeing that exposure adjustment as you're making it through the viewfinder. So the image that gets captured on your camera card and then what you bring onto your computer afterwards is the exact same thing as the image you're seeing as you're making it. It's a small distinction, but when you're doing it that way, it opens up a whole new world of creative seeing and artistic vision because all of a sudden now you can see the images as you make them. So, on these sort of scales, I sort of like to look at things very analytically. And when I look at the difference between a point-and-shoot camera, a mirrorless camera, and a digital SLR, I sort of score them all on a couple of different levels. Number one is price. And when you look at the scale of price from inexpensive to expensive, I always put mirror, uh, excuse me, point-and-shoot cameras at the top. They're inexpensive. They're very cheap. They're very disposable. 
Mirrorless cameras are, relatively speaking, a little more expensive than a point and shoot, but also significantly less expensive than a digital SLR. On the scale of size, from small to big, or light to heavy, you've got a point and shoot that's obviously very light. A mirrorless is a bit bigger than a point and shoot, but nowhere near the size of an SLR. When you look at quality, the imagery that you can make out of a camera, point and shoot is, or sorry, an SLR is great. Obviously, that's what many photographers go to professionally and non-professionally. A mirrorless camera arguably can make the exact same image as an SLR, the exact same image. My Fujifilm X-T1 has an APS-C sensor in it, which means it's not full frame, it is a crop sensor, but it's, for all intents and purposes, the same sensor that they put in any SLR that's not full frame. It's the same sensor. Again, it's that size thing. We see a smaller camera, we think it's not as great a quality. A mirrorless camera will give you the same image quality that you would get out of a DSLR. And then a point and shoot, the quality can be okay, depending on where you're going. And the last one is usability, in terms of something being easy or difficult to use. And I sort of score this on the scale of, if I take a camera, and give it to my dad who knows nothing about photography, is it easy for him to use or difficult for him to use? Obviously a point and shoot is easy. A mirrorless camera might be a little bit more overwhelming, but nowhere nearly that of a DSLR. I remember many times where I'd be you know, on my honeymoon actually, I brought my DSLR on my honeymoon with my wife in 2010 when we got married. And I remember we were taking pictures in one of the Caribbean islands and I had it with me and we wanted a picture of ourselves. So we give it to somebody to take our picture, and we kind of go over here, and like I think they had it pointed backwards or something. It's like they had never used a camera before, but it's just it's overwhelming. When you use these big things, they're like, oh, what button do I press on? I don't even know what this is. So it's, it's overwhelming for people, and a lot of professional photographers will feel that way when they get into it too. Mirrorless cameras are much easier and much simpler to use. So this is a, a fun little ad that Fujifilm runs, and, and I kind of like the message that it says because for the longest time, in photography, to be a professional photographer very much meant that you were a technician. It meant that you were kind of the gatekeeper to the technology that made the images. If you know how to work a camera, if you knew how to process film, if you knew all about lighting, then that was half the battle of being a photographer in the 80s and the 70s. That's over here. It was all about the camera. It was all about the knowledge of the technology, and we were the gatekeepers. I say we, I wasn't even born then, but photographers were the gatekeepers. But now we've sort of gone through this whole transition of now it's not necessarily about the camera, it's about the vision, the artistic uh, integrity of the photographer, and we don't need all of this big, heavy equipment. And I'll tell you that as a wedding photographer, that's one of the best things that I've ever gone through in changing to mirrorless. I don't quite walk around as like hip and happy as that guy over there, but at least it's a lot less heavy than uh, carrying around these big bags and SLRs and all kinds of lenses and all that kind of thing. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the importance of photography. Now, I would sort of be remiss to talk about mirrorless photography because mirrorless photography is uh, it's a tool. A camera is a tool, right? And the tool will really only be, uh, it can only take your vision as far as your vision will allow it. Oftentimes, I hear photographers that want to change cameras or upgrade cameras or say that, that this one's too entry level. I've never really met a photographer where their, their physical camera was the limitation to their creative ability to make images. Never. We have this sort of thing in the photography industry called gear acquisition syndrome, where we just get so excited about buying new things and we think that that's gonna be the solution to all of our problems. And I just wanna sort of clarify that that's not the case. You've gotta hone and sharpen what you see through your mind's eye. You've gotta really work on your own creative integrity so that you can make great images. And so although mirrorless photography was a turning point for me and my creative ability to see things, uh, it's not without my vision on what photography means that I'm able to execute on it. So I wanna talk about uh, and tell you sort of a, a few stories of some images that I've made, all with my mirrorless camera, my Fujifilm uh, X-T1 is what almost all of these are on, and uh, explain how my interpretation of photography and my philosophy on what you can do as a photographer has influenced that. So storytelling, obviously, is a big part of being a photographer. 
with our cameras, we are able to take what's in front of us and creatively make our own decisions to interpret that and represent that story in front of us in the way that makes sense for us. It's a very personal thing. And I want to give you a very tangible example. I was photographing the engagement session of Michael and Adrian. This is about three weeks ago. They were telling me about how recently Adrian had gone through all of these health scares. She had a concussion, she was in the hospital. It was a tough time, she lost all this weight, she just wasn't doing well. And Michael was there for her the whole time to guide her, to be with her, to be her rock, to be a shoulder for her. And he really was the supporter for her. And so as they're telling me this story, I'm thinking how can I tell that story through photography? And so I'm photographing them at a winery and I see this beautiful hill off into the, the area over to the left. And I wanted to have them walk up the hill, but not just normally walk up the hill. I wanted to have Michael guide Adrian up the hill so as to look as though he's guiding her. And when I did that, this is the image that I made. Now, this image by itself, I love. It's a great image. It's very dramatic. I love the composition of it. I love what I've done creatively with the image, but without the story behind it, this image means more to Michael and Adrian because of the story than it would to anyone just looking at it in a print competition. So story is a big part of what we do as photographers, and it's our job and our role to take what's in front of us, take a story that maybe we've been given, and interpret that in a way that makes sense for us. And that's how you can become a piece of the photography that you make. Now, when I'm photographing this with my mirrorless camera, if I wasn't using a mirrorless camera, could have I gotten this shot? Yes, absolutely. But the reason that mirrorless made this easier is because I was using the electronic viewfinder, I could see the exposure through the camera as I was making it. I didn't have to fiddle with settings. I didn't have to take a picture and then chimp it and look at it and make adjustments. I could just see it as I was making it and as I'm going lowering the exposure with my thumb as I'm taking the picture. So documenting is obviously for me as a wedding photographer, one of the most important pieces of what I do. I'm there to uh, document and capture what's happening on a wedding day. But a big part of documenting as a photographer is seeing not as a photographer. So being aware, being acutely aware of what's happening around you and having the ability to observe and then know when to photograph and when not to photograph. I was photographing the wedding of Marissa and Sam. We were at Chateau de Charmes in Niagara-on-the-Lake at a winery. And as Marissa, the bride, is getting ready just in front of the one window, I was photographing some of the bridesmaids off into the back corner. They were popping some champagne and having a good time. And I kind of noticed over my shoulder that Marissa's mom had sort of walked over to Marissa, and they were just alone as she was getting ready. And I hear out of the corner of my ear something along the lines of, I know you're no longer at home and you're moving on to you know, a, a different life now. You'll always be my little girl. And as I turn around quietly to make that image, this is the image that I captured. Again, could have I gotten this with an SLR? No question I could have. But because I was there, because I was in the moment, because I wasn't fiddling with lenses and trying to change settings and all kinds of crazy flash things and all that, I was just quietly in the corner with my little Fuji X-T1 observing what was happening around me. I was able to be nimble, to be quick, and capture the image in an instant. Because the moment after this was not nearly as impactful as this moment was. And oftentimes with photography, a second can make all the difference. I was photographing family portraits for a client of mine up in Port Dover, and they were telling me about, you know, when we're fa planning family portraits, I don't want to just go to a park and smile and be happy. I want to try and tell the story of this family and what's happening, what do they do, what do they do for fun, what is their children like? And we were walking, and they were telling me about how they always walk down this one path, they go to this one little ice cream shop, their son loves cotton candy ice cream, and he always likes to kind of play around and goof around and do what little boys do. So as we're going out and about and we're taking these family portraits, I said, I want to tell that story so that when this little boy is older, the parents have these beautiful images that represent who he is and what they did when he was a child. And so this is the image that I made of him. As he was climbing up a tree, being a goofball, as a boy, eating his cotton candy ice cream. Now, what you can't see is this is probably about eight feet up in the air. His dad's hand is actually holding him down here 
But being that he's up there, how am I able to get up there? I'm certainly not climbing a tree like that to get up there. But because the Fuji film uh, X-T1 has the flip down screen, I'm actually photographing that like this with the flip down screen pointed down towards me. So I'm able to capture the image as I see it with the camera up in the air. Now, has anyone ever actually tried to use the back of the screen live view on a DSLR? It's very, very difficult, right? It's not easy to do because you don't have autofocus. You're seeing all kinds of weird things. There's a bit of a lag behind it. That's a negative side effect of a DSLR because that's just the way that the technology works. With a mirrorless camera, the image you see on the back of the screen is the exact same image that you're seeing through the viewfinder. So you still have autofocus, you still have no lag, you have everything exactly as you'd see it through the viewfinder. And that's why I can interchangeably use the viewfinder to using the screen in the back of my camera to get images like this. I was photographing the wedding of Nicole and Lucas um, up north, and the nice thing about being a wedding photographer is that oftentimes you think you're just photographing the bride and groom. And there's a wonderful relationship between the bride and groom. Obviously, they're getting married. I'd hope there's a relationship. But oftentimes, there's other relationships and other connections that are happening on a wedding day that you need to be aware of. You need to see what's happening. And uh, Lucas and Nicole's brother, so the brother-in-law, his future brother-in-law, through the process of planning the wedding, had become very close. They had actually become best of friends. And he was in the wedding party. And so it was Lucas, the brother-in-law, and another friend in the wedding party. And they were typical guys having fun. They were really close, having a great connection. And that's what we were celebrating in this particular part of the day. The bride and groom hadn't seen each other yet. And I was photographing just the guys. And so as I'm photographing the guys, and again, I had the camera down by my hip, and I was using the back of the screen to look at it. And someone said something funny, they're up against a wall and they both just started, or all three of them started cracking up laughing. And that's the image that I made. That celebration, you think the bride is not gonna love that image because that's her groom right here, her brother and the groom's other groomsmen. That's what we're celebrating through photography. And unless you are aware of that and you're on your feet and you're nimble and you're able to move quickly to get images like that, again, with this image, the moment after this wouldn't have been the, the same. It wouldn't have been nearly the same. So I'm photographing uh, Lisa, who's getting married in Niagara Falls. And in the morning of the wedding, uh, we're photographing the details. My wife has got, who's my second shooter, has the flowers and the jewelry and all these things off to the side. And I'm photographing hair and makeup being done. And the mother pulls me aside and she says, I just want you to know that the veil that she's wearing, that um, Lisa is wearing, is her grandmother's veil, who has since passed away. So it's very important for them. It's a, it's a tradition, it's a memento, it's something that her sister wore at her wedding. So I said, okay, I kind of made note of it, and I said, this is something that's very obviously important for this bride. It's important for her mother, it's important for their tradition, it's important for their family. And if I were just to go through the same formula of going in and, okay, bride by a window, look up, look down, smile, look out, turn around, go over here, flowers up, flowers down. If I were to treat it formulaic without having my own personal sort of... Uh, vision injected into it, I would have easily missed that piece of importance for them. So I brought Lisa to the window. I posed her in a really, really elegant and sort of soft, classy way to sort of uh, give a tip of the hat to the veil and the tradition and what that meant to the family. And that's the image that I made with them. Now, this image and this style of image is something that I've really personally been drawn to since switching to mirrorless. And I think the reason that I'm drawn to it, this sort of darker and moodier and very uh, contrasty look, I mean, I've always made contrasty images, but this sort of soft, subtle contrast is something I've only started to discover since I've moved to mirrorless because I can see the image as I'm making it. And all of a sudden, I'm more acutely aware of shadows and highlights and tone and all these things that go in to make an image have mood and feeling. I'm more aware of it because I can see it as I'm making it. Who prints their photography here? I hope a lot of hands come up. Okay, I'm not gonna go too deep on this, but um, it's been sort of my memento for the past, I've been a photographer for 10 years. For the past five years that I've been teaching, I've made it a big point to always emphasize the importance of print. And it's something that I really feel has been lost in this digital generation. 
Uh, there's so many of us that just enjoy it, images on Facebook, or we put them on our iPad, or we enjoy them on the computer, on a hard drive. But the fact of the matter is, is that, in my opinion, an image is not real until it's printed. An image isn't real until it's printed. And I actually mean that literally, because when an image is digital, it's a bunch of zeros and ones. It means nothing. If that hard drive that that image is stored on were to blow up or were to die for any reason, that image is lost forever, forever. Yet I have images from my grandfather's grandfather that still stand the test of time because it was printed. There's a sort of joke that I use often at wedding shows when I do them, and I only do one wedding show a year. And at the wedding show, where most photographers will have all these albums laid out and all these things, I have that as well. But I have this stack of three and a half inch floppy disks beside my booth. And uh, I make a point that as a bride and groom approaches my booth, I take out the floppy disk and I go to them and I say, hey, you know, great to meet you. Um, this is my portfolio. I would love it if you'd bring it home onto your computer at your own time and enjoy it. Go ahead and look through it and see if you connect with any of my imagery. And I hand them the three and a half inch floppy disk. And almost every time, usually the guy is like, oh, yeah, I can, we can do that. We can find a computer to do that. And the bride's all like, ooh, that's very cute. And then obviously after a minute or two of them kind of trying to figure it out, I tell them, obviously, you don't have a computer that can read that floppy disk, do you? And then they'll usually admit that, no, they don't. And my point is just that. If I give you a DVD of your wedding photos, what are you going to do with it in 10 years from now? If I give you a USB key with your wedding photos, what are you going to do with it five years from now? Because technology goes out of style. Technology gets outdated. Technology changes. Printing is forever. A wedding album is forever. And so I really just want to encourage you guys, if you're not currently printing your photography, even if it's just four by sixes that you print off at the local lab and put it into a shoebox, give yourself something to pass down. And that's a big part of photography. That's a big part of what we do. I was photographing uh, Beth and Mike's wedding, and Mike was running around the reception hall with his niece. And they always do this kind of, he gets down and they do kind of peekaboo, and they play these little games, and she was really fun and having a, having a blast. And uh, I knew that that was something, like that's a story. That's something that she'll always remember and he'll always remember, that's what they do, that's their relationship. If I were just to make that image or try and document that and give him a digital copy, it might be there, it may not be there, but in the thousands of photos that they have, tens of thousands of photos they have, uh, who, who's to say she'll ever see that image? So this is the image that I made of Mike and his niece, and this was almost a full page in their wedding album because it was such an important moment for them. And the likelihood of her seeing their wedding album versus her seeing all the digital files that they got is a lot greater for the wedding album. The same wedding, in the morning, I'm photographing Beth, and she's sort of with all the hustle bustle and all these the crazy things happening that happen the morning of a wedding. And I sort of notice that she's feeling a little anxious, she's feeling a little bit self-conscious about things, and she's kind of a little bit stressed. And I said, come over here, just take a moment. I brought her into the other room, away from all the busyness, and I just kind of let her breathe. And I wanted to create an image of her, but I was very quiet, I was very soft, I was very slow about it. And I made this image of Beth and I showed her the image on the back of the screen right after I caught it. Now, for the record, this is directly out of the camera. In fact, almost all of the images I've shown you today are directly out of the camera on my Fuji X-T1. When I showed Beth this image, she cried because she said, wow, I look like a bride. I said, well, yeah, you are a bride. <laughs> but this is what we can give to people through photography. This is the gift that we have with a camera in our hands. A couple more quick ones here. This one is, are there any children in the audience? No children, good. I was gonna skip it quickly. So I'm photographing um, a mother who had just had a, a child about six months ago. And she had contacted me saying that she, want, she had seen some of my, my boudoir photography work and she was interested in doing a session because she feels like she hasn't given herself any time. And for anyone that has gone through the process of having children, you know that the first six months are always often very difficult because you're not sleeping, you're kind of a mess all the time, your hair's up in a ponytail, you're doing all these things, it's very stressful and it's a lot of work and you're giving, giving, giving to your child. And so Kayla wanted to celebrate herself and her beauty and show that she still has it. So 
while in a time where she was very self-conscious and very aware of some of the flaws in her body and wasn't really focusing on her health and that kind of thing, this is the image that I made for her. And this is what I was able to show her that her husband sees. This is what I was able to show her, the beauty that she has within her, that she's always had. And whether or not she has a child and hasn't focused on health and, and exercising and all that, there's still beauty. There's still a sense of pride that she should have there in herself. Now, this image in specific, this is similar to the other image that I had earlier of the bride with the veil. This is the style of imagery that's really attracted me with my mirrorless camera because I'm able to see those highlights and shadows as I'm making the images. And it makes a big difference. Connection is another big part of what we photograph and we showcase through photography. Uh, I was photographing Marissa and Sam. I showed you Marissa earlier with her mom by the window. And, and after their ceremony, they had a 250-person wedding at Chateau de Charmes, a big winery in Niagara Lake. And it was kind of this big to-do. There was family flying in. They were both Americans. So there was family flying in from everywhere. They were very overwhelmed after their ceremony. There was all these things happening. And they had their receiving line. And after their receiving line, I could kind of just look at them and tell they were totally flustered. So I said, guys, come over here. We're going to do some photos of just the two of you. And I said, come over here. We're going to go into this little kind of wooded area by Chateau. And I said, I want you guys just to go in there and just have a moment for a second. Like, just breathe, just kind of connect, just realize that you just got married, you know? And so I had them go in there, and I at first wasn't even photographing. I let them go do their thing. And then I slowly started to, you know, kind of walk over closer to where they were. And because I wasn't going in guns a-blazing with, you know, big lenses and flashes and bags and all that, I was just very nimble, very quiet, very quick. And I went in there and I got this image of them. They didn't know I was taking this image because I was kind of being sneaky. I was being like a sniper behind a bush. You should have seen me. But, uh, you know, that's, that's the image that I got. And that's what we photograph and we celebrate through photography. Last story here. And this is two boys that I was photographing a family portrait for with their family. And both of them are adopted. And they're both adopted from uh, two different third world countries. And the parents, they had obviously had some fertility issues and weren't able to have children of their own, so they adopted these two boys. One was five and one was seven, I believe. And there's nothing like a connection between brothers, whether it's real brothers or brothers that have now grown up together over a couple of years that were adopted from two completely different areas. And I wanted to document and photograph and showcase the joy that these boys had together and the energy and the youth that these boys had together. And so this is the same family that we were hiding under the cover when it started to pour rain during our session. And this is the image that I got of the two of them. This is another style of image that I wouldn't have been able to get this without that flip screen on the back of my mirrorless camera. Because as I was looking at the boys, talking with them, joking with them, I was able to see in the back of the camera down below me here, and I'm just kind of making images, looking down and going back and forth. If I had this big giant black box in between me and the boys, their connection and their connection with me would have been completely different. I said earlier about some of this sort of style that I've grown to love through uh, using a mirrorless camera. And it's this idea of being able to convey feeling through an image. And it's kind of a weird thing when you really think about it because we're trying to convey something that is so emotive and convey something that is so untangible through something as tangible as an image and through photography. And so I was photographing a model portrait for this girl who had recently gone through some tough times and she had gone through depression she had gone through some uh, health battles with everything she was going through. And I said, I wanted to sort of try and convey this sense of inner struggle that she's gone through, through an image as a way of conveying feeling and conveying mood. Now, it's a very difficult thing to do because you're trying to create something kind of dark and a little bit moody through an image. And this is the image that I got of her, and I thought it perfectly portrayed who she was and the time of her life that she was going through. Is this a happy time that she's going through? No, but by stretching myself creatively and as a photographer, as an image maker, to try and convey feeling and mood and emotion through photography and into a tangible medium of an image, I'm able to portray that for people. And if I can do it in the happy times, I can do it in the rough times as well. 
this style of image is definitely not one that I've ever seen myself do with an SLR. Because as I'm seeing with my mirrorless camera, and as I'm seeing this image as you see it here in the back of my camera as I'm making the image, I'm able to get myself to a place of telling the story in the way that I want to tell the story. I'm able to get myself in the place where all of a sudden I can start to see these warm tones, these dark shadows, these highlights, the way that the sun glistens off her hair. I'm able to see exactly what you see up there in real life through my camera. If I was photographing with an SLR, this image would have been a lot brighter because I was seeing it brighter through the camera. It was sunrise, it was pretty bright out. Yet because I'm able to all of a sudden change completely the way that I'm seeing something, because I'm seeing through the electronic viewfinder of the mirrorless camera, I'm able to make an image like this. I started out at the beginning talking about um, how the most important part of what we do is our own vision. And I think that in the last half an hour, I've just shown you some of how I see photography and how I interpret what happens in front of my camera and how I want to tell stories and document things through photography. And this is a great quote by Ansel Adams. He says, the single most important component of a camera is the 12 inches behind it. So my encouragement to you guys is, what I've just shared with you is my vision of photography and how I interpret photography and what I think is important with photography. For me, mirrorless photography has completely transformed how I see things for the reasons I've stated. And maybe that's gonna be the case for you. Maybe, you know, for me, I got into it for personal reasons. I shared my story at the beginning where I just wanted to have an easier camera to carry around to photograph my daughter and to photograph my family and my wife and to be in some of the images myself. But that process of doing that has completely transformed my professional work. And now I'm photographing about 90% of my work with my mirrorless camera. So, and for, for those that question, because I've had, I've had lots of people question, well, how does it stack up? I've made 10 by 15 wedding albums with a Nikon file beside my Fuji file. And if I didn't tell you which was which, you would never be able to tell. I've had Fuji files printed on a billboard, and I've never had anyone question the quality of it. So don't be mistaken for what you see in terms of size. Remember to focus on your vision, focus on your interpretation, focus on storytelling, focus on the basics of photography and use your camera as a tool to tell those stories. Use, those cam use your camera as a tool to be an extension of your vision. And only when you get to that point can you make a statement with your photography. Now, that's all that I have in terms of a formal presentation. If anyone has questions, I'm happy to stand around and answer them. Fujifilm is at their booth over there. I think they've got some great sales going on right now if you're interested in getting into uh, a mirrorless camera. Uh, if you want to know more about what I use, what I shoot with, anything like that, fire it at me and I'm happy to answer it so everyone can hear the answers. But other than that, thank you guys for coming. Are there any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so the lens that I used for about 90% of my photography is a 56 millimeter 1.2 lens. It's the Fujifilm 56. Um, now, because the X-T1 is an APS-C sensor, it's a crop sensor, and so that turns the 56 millimeter lens into an 85, which for me is a really great uh, field of view. It's a great perspective. It gives me that sense of being in with somebody because it's long enough, but not so much that I'm gonna alienate myself if they're too close. So it kind of gives me that nice balance. And for me, when I'm photographing with Fuji, I literally just have my camera and my lens. I, I mean, I've got all the other lenses that Fuji has, but for the most part, I keep that 56 locked on it, and I just want to be in the moment. I kind of want to just roam and just be able to have my camera in my hands and photograph with what I have on me. Yep. Any other questions? Yeah. I'm sorry? So the camera that I use is the Fujifilm X-T1. Yep. Uh, we also have the Fujifilm X-E2, which is the sort of the generation behind it. It's the rangefinder style camera. Uh, they've got all of them over at the booth if you want to see them. But the X-T1 is more of an SLR styled look. So it's got like the hump in the middle. And, but it's, uh, it's kind of got a bit of a throwback. All the Fuji cameras do. They've kind of got a throwback to the film cameras. Uh, there's lots of dials on it. It's very mechanical. Um, everything has you know, got a switch or a dial or a knob or something on it. So it's very much, uh, for me, 
very much like a personal experience. I'm not diving into menus to do all kinds of things. Instead, I'm changing physical knobs and dials on the camera as I need them. So that's why, that's why I love them. Yep. 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 Yeah. Uh, so good question. So talking about the JPEGs out of the camera, Fuji is actually known in the industry among photographers to have some of the best quality JPEGs directly out of the camera. And I can vouch for that without question because all these images that you saw here were JPEGs out of the camera. I actually typically don't even do anything to my images that I take with my Fuji. Whereas before, I mean, I photograph raw JPEGs. So I have a raw copy and a JPEG copy of every image that I make. And for 95% of my images that don't need any significant tweaking or any work, the JPEG goes to the client. And the JPEG is what I use for everything. Because the JPEG processing in the camera for Fuji is incredible. In fact, I've tried to replicate it. I've tried to take a, a Fuji RAW file and make a Fuji JPEG file. And they make sim film simulations. They make color presets and things for Lightroom and Bridge and all these. And I literally cannot remake the exact same look that you get out of a Fuji camera. The way that it renders uh, tone, the way that, it, that the sharpness and the crispness on the edges, the color rendition of everything, like images like this, the warmth, this is at like 10,000 Kelvin white balance. And the warmth that you get out of camera on the Fuji, the uh, transition from highlights to midtones, it's very buttery, it's very smooth. Um, everything, the shadows are very dark but still have details. It's wonderful. So right at a camera, the Fuji JPEGs are phenomenal. In fact, I've never seen a camera get the dynamic range that I get from my Fuji camera. Right, so good question. So in Fuji, there's a setting for dynamic range, and you can do dynamic range 100, which is basically default. I think dynamic range 200, dynamic range 400. Um, I set it just to 100. I don't adjust that, actually. And even still with that, I have many times, actually, this is an example, I can photograph the sunlight hitting a subject and the shadow beside them and still have detail in both. I've never seen that in an SLR that I've ever photographed with. I know on paper, they technically have the exact same dynamic range. But I'll tell you from application and from using it as a photographer, Fuji has a much greater dynamic range to my eye. Yep, yeah. For lighting? No, so the lighting on this is just sun. This is just sunrise right here, yeah. So, yes, yes. So I always photograph in Kelvin white balance mode. So when I'm photographing that, that basically, instead of using a preset like cloudy or sunny or like that kind of thing, I photograph in Kelvin, which is a scale from 2,500 Kelvin to 10,000 Kelvin. So I can adjust how warm or how cool I want an image to be. For this particular image, uh, I was trying to convey that warm, sort of dark, moody sunrise. So I photographed this at 10,000 Kelvin. Because I see that, and that's the thing, is when I'm photographing this, I may have started at 6,700 Kelvin. I normally start there as a base point, but as I'm looking through the camera and seeing this image, I can see that that's too cool, that's not warm enough. So I just slide with my finger until I see the image that I'm trying to make as I'm making it, and then I press the button. So I'm actually doing my editing, my Photoshopping, my post-processing in camera as I'm photographing. Many times, like the image I showed you earlier with the bride with the veil in front of her face, I may have previously taken that image and then had to underexpose it in post-processing. Well, I'm actually making that and doing that adjustment as I'm creating the image. So I'm looking through the viewfinder, and because I can see the image that I'm taking, I'll just adjust the exposure and bring it down until I see it and then click the button. So I'm doing my post-processing in camera. Multiply that by 800 images, it saves me a lot of time. Yeah, so, the, so if you shoot in black and white, can you convert to color? When I shoot, so like I said, I photograph raw and JPEG. So I actually, for every image, I get two. The JPEG will always stay in black and white. I can't change that. But the raw does not have that applied to it, so I can go back to color if I need to with the raw. Yep. Yep. Any other questions, thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, so does Fuji come with a full frame? There is no full frame for Fuji just yet. Uh, they're all APS-C sensors. Um, but for, like I said, for argument's sake, like there's, uh, I, I've gotten in many arguments with professional photographers about this whole full frame versus APS-C. My question always in every decision that I make is why? 
why would I need a full frame? And why is an APS-C sensor not enough for me? And you could say, oh, well, the, the mega this, or the this, this, or the this, this. I say, yeah, OK. Let me show you a 40 by 60 that I printed with an APS-C sensor, and you tell me that it's not good enough. That's my argument for it. The only difference is that it's a smaller sensor. The resolution is still really high. I think my X-T1 is the 24 megapixel camera. It's really high. I have, no, I have no problems with it. I have a Nikon D4S that I still photograph some things with when I need action or movement. And you know that's full frame. Do I see the difference between the two of them? No. Yeah, so what I use as zoom lens is the question. Um, Fuji's zoom lenses are phenomenal, and I have a lot of them. I like to photograph with the prime lenses because I like what prime does for me. Uh, it forces me to use my body to zoom. You know, It forces me to get in the place that I want to get to and not just kind of be lazy and stand there and zoom. Um, also, for me, the reason that I initially switched to Fuji is because how small everything was. And so you start to get zoom lenses involved, and they are going to get bigger because you have to have room for the zooming and everything that goes along with that. So the Fuji zoom lenses are phenomenal, but for me, I love the primes too much. Yeah. Do I use flashes? So with my Fuji, I, I can. I've got, uh, I think it's CyberSync that makes them. It's, a, it's a, a wireless controller that I put on top of my Fuji, and then I can attach it to any flash, and it'll trigger it all. But I don't really use it. Um, because for me, again, like the process of photographing with Fuji for me is about getting this very raw, very natural, very real look. And I'm not going to get that effect with a flash, at least not without any sense of ease or without having to fiddle with it uh, to get that look that I want. So for me, I'm 99% I'm natural light with Fuji. Yeah, so the question is, um, how can you get the image quickly uh, if you're sort of in a bind, right? You've got the guys laughing in front of you, and you got to get it right away. For me, I normally almost always start in aperture priority mode. In fact, 80% of my Fuji work is with aperture priority mode. I don't use that as a crutch to not learn manual mode. Obviously, I photograph a lot of things with manual mode, and I understand uh, what goes into making an image in manual mode. But for me, photographing in aperture priority mode means that as soon as I point and focus, I'm usually pretty close to getting the exposure that I want. And because I've got the exposure compensation dial in the back here with my thumb, as I'm looking through it, I'll just go like this, up or down, and that gives me the exposure that I want. So I can literally point at zero exposure compensation, adjust up or adjust down as I need to, and in a matter of like less than a second, I can get the image. Yeah. Yeah, so for ISO, no, I, I adjust it depending on where I'm at. If I'm photographing like outside, I'll be lower, like you know, 400 or 200. Um, I've photographed with Fuji uh, as high as ISO 6400. I have no questions, no problems with it whatsoever. And in fact, if anything, I love the noise that Fuji film cameras make. The the grain, it's it almost has a film-like feel to it, and less of a digital artifact-style noise. So I actually really like it. Yeah. Any other questions, thoughts, comments, concerns? Yeah. Color simulation? Yeah, so uh, with Fuji, there's six, five or six different color or film simulations. So it's their way of taking some of the older uh, films that photographers would photograph with and uh, replicating that digitally. I use the Astia film simulation mode. Um, it is really uh, nice with skin tones. It's very softening for skin tones. Uh, the saturation is nice. It's not too much. Um, and yet the contrast on the edges is really beautiful. So that's, that's the film simulation I use. I do, yeah. So, and that's, the nice thing is, I mean, you can get as technical as you want with these cameras. Um, I, there, you can make an entire preset in camera of shadow adjustments, highlights adjustments, contrast, saturation, film simulation mode, and save it all as a preset in the camera. So then I just quickly grab that preset and photograph with it. And that's how when I say I'm doing my post-processing in camera, I am. I'm literally almost doing, to an extent, my levels in camera. So I've got a couple different presets, one for high contrast, one for low contrast, one for black and white, one for landscape. And I'll choose those based on what I'm photographing. So I'm kind of doing my post-processing in camera. Yep. Great. All right, guys. Thank you, everyone, for coming. 
heading over to the Fujifilm booth. Woohoo!